Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, again, welcome everyone to our last session in our spring education series for 2001. We are really excited to have everyone here and thank you to everyone who was able to participate or at least watch our recorded sessions. We had eight. So to give you a little overview, this workshop series is sponsored by MnDOT's Office of Aeronautics and administered by the Airport Technical Assistance Program, also known as AirTAP. We are located at the Center for Transportation Studies at the, at the University of Minnesota. So AirTAP began in 2000. It was the first of its kind in the nation offering practical yet specialized training and resources across the state for those who operate, maintain, and administer Minnesota's public use airport. Minnesota's general aviation personnel across the state have had access to targeted information and training to reduce costs and improve the quality, safety, and the overall efficiency of airport operations. AirTap also helps airport staff build a community network for exchanging best practices and learning from one another. So AirTap, we have four major service categories. One is education and training. So in addition to this series that we put on this past spring, in the fall, we have an airport 101 for those who are newer to the airport community. And also we help support the annual airports conference held at the end of April. We provide technical assistance, access to experts, and we have a variety of resources and printed materials on our website, which is airtap.umn.edu. As I mentioned earlier, this is an eight part series. This is the final session. Uh, understanding lease agreements. Our previous sessions, if you were uh, unable to attend, they were reported and they are available on our website. Again, our air it's airtap.umn.edu. And finally, if you are new or newer to Zoom meeting platform, along the bottom of your screen, there's a, bla there's a black ribbon. On the left hand side is mute. Everyone is currently muted. If you'd like to have a conversation with our speakers instead of entering or typing in your questions, you can certainly unmute yourself and have a conversation. Um, video, everyone, you can have it in stop video mode during the presentation. Feel free at the end to, un to show your vi video if you'd like. Um, everyone can see who's attending right now. The chat box is next to the share screen. This is where we want you to input any questions you may have throughout the presentation. We will address them at appropriate times. Share screen is active for everyone. Um, you won't need it, so you don't have to worry about that. This session is being recorded, and feel free to use the reaction buttons uh, throughout the presentation. I'm going to stop sharing and hand it over to our moderator, Melissa Underwood. Thanks, Catherine. My name is Melissa Underwood, and I'm an airport planner with SEH, and I'll be moderating our Understanding Lease Agreement session today. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with our presentation. I'm going to give a overview of, of kind of why we're here today, and then I'll turn it over to our guest speakers. So can everyone see the presentation screen? Good? Yes. All right, great. Well, welcome everybody to Understanding Lease Agreements. Um, this is a big topic that many airports um, have to work on throughout the year. So we thought we'd give an overview of what a lease agreement is, maybe how it's different from minimum standards and how you can work with your city or county and other airport stakeholders to develop these type of agreements at your airport. So I'm going to lay out like kind of some steps and process that you follow through and then what we're going to focus on today. So developing a lease agreement is your agreement with the tenants at your airport, whether they're owning a private hangar, a tea hangar space, their commercial use, or any other type of business that's operating at your airport. This is your agreement on how you work with them. So the first steps that you'll take in these type of agreements is meeting with your governing authority and with your stakeholders to determine what type of leases you want at your airport and what the, the format of this type of document will look like. Um, and then your role as the airport sponsor is to review your airport layout plan to see what type of leases you would have at your airport, review your grant assurances, and make sure that the agreements that you're making aren't conflicting with some of the other FAA rules and other rules at your airport. 
Um, you can review other agreements that you have, like minimum standards, which is an AirTap session we had on April 12, 22nd. And that's recorded, like Catherine was mentioning. So you can go and look at what minimum standards are as well. Um, and look at your airport management and other agreements that you have at your airport. And then determine what type of agreements you want to have and what type of leases are, seem appropriate at your facility. There's the financial determination piece where you look at what type of rates and charges you'd like to have and how you can determine what those numbers will be, whether it's calling neighboring airports or um, comparing what else is going on in your community. And then preparing the actual lease agreement, which is what the majority of our discussion will be about today. Then the last couple of steps are executing that agreement and meeting with your tenants and enacting these documents that you've put together. At the end or during this presentation, Catherine will um, send out a resource page. So we have references that you can review to gain additional information. There's a great checklist from an ACRP handbook. I do have a copy of it here. Um, it gives you an understanding and um, kind of asks you questions that make sure that you're including in your leases and that you're following rules and thinking about everything that you should be thinking about when you're pulling together these documents. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our guest speakers today. We're gonna to start with Bill Towell. Bill is the airport director at the St. Cloud Regional Airport. And Dave Beaver is the airport manager at the Owatonna Degner Regional Airport. And we have them here as our, our experts or our guides on pulling together these lease agreements. Uh, we want our presentation to be very interactive. So please put in your questions in that chat box and we can ask them as we go, or we can follow up at the end as well. And I'm, I'm hoping these two are a great resource for you um, in the future as you're developing your agreements. So with that, I will turn it over to Bill. Hey, thanks Melissa and uh, thanks Catherine. Um, morning everybody, happy to be here. Um, so we'll talk about the elements of the lease and you know, really to start off, depending upon what you put in your lease, it's really gonna set the stage for whether it can withstand changes in staff, different ownership or tenant management that might be on your airport. Um, the following elements that we're gonna talk about that help craft a lease, you know, will, um, you know if, if they're very ambiguous, that's what's gonna be uh, causing disputes. So we wanna make sure we're really clear in what we put in our lease. And, and um, uh, we'll talk about that kind of throughout this, throughout this session is, you know, at various times it's a, you gotta make sure you're clear on who's responsible for what. Otherwise, again, that's where disputes, um, that's where disputes occur. So if it's, a, it's an ambiguous lease, you're likely gonna set yourself up for problems in the future. So the first couple ones are pretty easy. Lessor, this is the landlord, right? All names, addresses, sometimes signatures can be in here. Um, a lot of times we're gonna have the signature in the signature block that might be at the end, but it can be in this area as well. But we wanna make sure we identify who the lessor is. So in my case, it's you know the city of St. Cloud operating in you know St. Cloud, Minnesota, you know Stearns County, and making sure that we have all of that information in there of clearly who is the lessor. And, and then in this area, again, you can specifically uh, you know, talk about who's authorized to execute the agreement. But I think more specifically, it's going to be that that may be in the signature block of, hey, we have the, you know, the lessor is the city, but later on down in the signature block, it's going to be, you know, you know, Sally Smith is going to be able to sign for that. Now, if that's the case, then you just want to make sure that that contact and that name is updated, you know, if that changes and that person, you know, doesn't work for the, the lessor anymore or isn't authorized to execute the agreement, um, then, then that'll have to change at some point as well. So the lessee, again, another one, these first two are pretty easy, but the lessee, um, obviously this is the tenant or the person or the business that leases the property from the owner. One of the things you want to make sure of is make sure to include any doing business as, right? So if it's XYZ company owns Sally Smith mechanic shop, that you wanna make sure that you put that all in there. The agreement will be with XYZ company, but they're doing business as Sally Smith mechanic shop. So that has to be in there to make sure that it's very clear who the lessee is. Um, and, and again, if it's not later in the lease that we talked about, maybe towards the signature block, 
or at some other spot, you know, this would be a good spot for, you know, who's the primary contact, right? Who do you notify of any changes? And if that changes, um, you know, then uh, then you got to make sure you want to make sure that uh, that you're making those changes in there related to the lessee. Yeah, and uh, good morning. Before I start on kind of, we're, Bill and I will be sort of trading back and forth on this as we go through the presentation here. And again, please uh, put in your chat questions if you have anything as we go along. Uh, and thank you for the introduction. Also, uh, my name is Dave Beaver. Good morning. I'm from Owatonna. I've been here 20, 25 years. And just a little disclaimer before I start here uh, also is I'm not an attorney. I'm not a lease expert. I've been an airport manager for a long time. Uh, one of the things I really, really enjoy about AirTap is it gives us all an opportunity to get together and exchange ideas and have a discussion about things that are happening on our airports, practical things like leases, and hopefully we can all pick up bits and pieces and tidbits that'll help us along the way. But um, I'm going to do my best to uh, uh, borrow from my experience to help present here and uh, just to continue on on elements and sort of the anatomy of a lease here, uh, premises. Uh, pretty pretty basic too. I mean, that's the whole uh, uh, meat and potatoes of the lease. What is being leased? And a lot of that depends on the type of lease. Uh, I know general aviation airports were maybe focused more on um, uh, T hangers and private hangers and those kind of things, but there can also be commercial type leases, non-commercial type leases. So I would encourage you before you get into all of this is to sit down, as Melissa said, and talk with your stakeholders, talk about your leasing policy and all of those things and maybe what areas of the airport you will use for commercial, non-commercial, those types of things. Uh, but basically the what the premises is, is the improvements on the property and the property itself that is being leased or conveyed to uh, another party. Uh, so that can be a T hanger, uh, aircraft storage, land lease. Uh, you're also including the facilities um, and um, anything else uh, uh, in a commercial lease may also be um, uh, include types of uh, uses. So for uses of uh, premises, again, that depends on if it's land, if it's existing facilities and hangars, if it's going to be commercial use, if there's some sort of grant of authority to an FBO to uh, operate and manage the airport, those sort of things can be included in the agreement. Uh, for private hangar land leases, um, uh, I would say that if you're just going to lease a part of a land or a parcel to build a hangar, uh, you would want to include such thing as construction of the hangar. Uh, you don't want to lease a piece of ground on the airport and convey that to someone for a 20 or 30 year term and uh, we'll get to building the hangar at some point down the road. 10 years or so go by and finally the hangar gets put up. So you would wanna talk about construction of the hangar and what can be uh, uh, done in the hangar, um, whether that's aircraft storage, typically that you, you know, a lot of times there's questions on, hey, can I put uh, boats, trailers, that kind of stuff in my hangar. So you wanna specify that it is for aviation and aeronautical purpose, aircraft storage, maintenance on, uh, your own aircraft, uh, and typically that would be non-commercial use too. And for a T hanger, uh, you would look at just primarily aircraft storage. Uh, again, very important is the fixed amount of time in which uh, the lease agreement is in effect, and that would be the lease term that's typically defined pretty early on in the lease document. Again, considering what type of lease, um, uh, a, a private hangar lease, an owner that's going to invest and build and make improvements to a, a parcel of land, it would be important to know that they would need typically a longer term in order to amortize the costs of building the hangar. If it's a T hangar, you probably don't want a 20 or 30 year term. You would want a shorter term agreement in order to be able to control the uh, rates and uh, use of that property. Um, but you would also want to consider renewal terms in both types of leases. Um, uh, escalation of rents, I know Bill's gonna talk a little bit about rents, but if it's a longer term lease, you want the, um, the rents to keep up with the cost of living and uh, the, air, the FAA is interested in making sure that the airport is as self-sufficient as possible. So you'd want to be able to um, keep up with the escalation of rents. 
Uh, reversion's a hot topic in especially private hangar and improvements on airports. We'll get into that a little bit later, but what happens at the end of the term of the lease is pretty much what that is about because in the end on an airport property, the city or the airport owner or sponsor owns that uh, parcel of land and cannot convey it in any way uh, long-term. Uh, so then the other, the other thing you want to consider is compliance with airport leasing policy. Uh, anything, the FAA says anything over 50 years can be considered a conveyance or a disposal of airport property, so they would not support any term longer than 50 years. So, uh, David touched on uh, rents and rates and charges and stuff. That, uh, we'll talk about some more of those things that he had in in the term, which is it's great to have them there. Um, but then also there can be a separate uh, element or line item paragraph for rents and rates and charges. And of course, so rent is typically determined by fair market value. The, the easiest way to get to fair market value is simply do something like go out for bids, get quotes, those kind of things. That's really, you know, fair market value is what is somebody willing to pay? And if you go through a competitive bidding process um, that, uh, you know, somebody's going to tell you what they're willing to pay and you'll, you'll get the highest value related to that. In our case, a lot of times what will happen is we have several hangers. Um, there's uh, there's not several people that are willing to rent. So we just set a rate uh, waiting for somebody to come out and maybe rent the hangar or rent the building, rent the land, whatever it might be. So in that case, you may have to go through the appraisal process. And that would be you were trying to set it yourself and you would appraise that property um, and, uh, and, and try to put a value on it for when somebody comes in. So supply and demand is certainly in your favor in the event that um, you can use supply and demand, meaning you have more than supply that can help boost up that fair market value. Uh, but a lot of times we're not able to do that uh, because there's just not a lot of people knocking on the door trying to get on, onto the airport. They, you know, kind of that development or rental a lot of times is slow. Um, it can be difficult to try to come up with that. So when we talked about an appraisal, um, e even an appraisal might be difficult because there's not a lot to compare to locally, right? Um, if you're selling your house, there's lots of comparisons. In fact, even in your neighborhood, there's lots of comparisons. Um, you know, it's uh, that might be similarly situated. You're in the same kind of you know area that has the same cost of living. So here we try to to determine that based on you know, we might try to look at similar sized airports and see what they're getting for land rent. But even that isn't necessarily apples to apples um, because they're just in a different part of the state or a different part of the country. And it's hard to compare based on what the cost of living is um, in their area versus yours. So it can be, it can be difficult. Some of the other things that to determine um, if you're basing, uh, if you're trying to ter determine rent on land, different factors such as are there utilities on the land, right? Is it just simply a, a green space without water and sewer? Or do you have water and is gas and electric and all the other things already there? That can, that can increase the value of that property. Access, is there public access to the area of, you know, the building that somebody's leasing from the airport or the property, right? A lot of times access may be diminished because in, in the event of St. Cloud, right, in, in, uh, in my, you know, an example would be, we have a fence that goes all the way around our airport and it can be uh, difficult to access inside the fence. So that can, um, uh, that can help determine what the value of that property, it'll be down. How about location in terms of location on the airfield? You know, the prime location is, you know, for a business would be a building that has public access you know, on the front door and the back door has access to the main ramp where, you know, most of the, most of the activity is taking place with, uh, with aircraft. So the, all of those things taken into account, if you're going to determine rent on land and really, to be honest with you, rent on a building, right? If, if you own a building the airport does, and you're trying to lease that, some of those things can play, play in there as well. In this same element of a lease, you'll want to talk about timing of the payment, right? Do you want the payment? Uh, at the, you know, for the fifth of the month, every month for that month? Um, do you pay in advance? Do you pay after the month? As well as what penalties if it's late, right? A lot of times there's just simply a percentage. If you don't pay by the fifth of the month, um, that there's gonna be some kind of percentage, or you could certainly set just as a, um, 
you know, certain dollar amount that just says, listen, if you're late, um, then you got to pay this kind of dollar amount. So the next one is, and David talked about this, it's uh, escalation clause. And I'll get a little bit more into detail in this, uh, but you're right. The FAA wants us to be as self-sufficient as, as uh, possible. We also know that there's inflation and, um, you know, cost of living continues to go up. So if you're able to establish a fair market value rent for the building that you're leasing, um, in that fair market value has gone up. And if you don't provide a clause or some kind of provision in there, in the lease for that, um, the airport's losing money. And so you want to make sure that there is a clause in there that says um, every year it's going to increase or escalate at this rate. You know, some different ways that that can be done is if you're, if you're leasing a building, you could reappraise the building every year. Now, that, that would be costly. And to be honest with you, that would be unproductive, counterproductive, because you're trying to increase the rent so you generate more revenue. At the same time, you're taking whatever profit that would be or revenue increase into another appraisal, which is just seems crazy. However, you could do something like that every five years. And if you don't want to reappraise, you could you know, start with, the, with the appraisal process, but then have some kind of a clause in there that says every five years will reevaluate what it is that we're leasing, right? So we'll, we'll likely have something like a consumer price index or a percentage tied to this so that every year that that's our escalation clause every year. However, we still wanna set a base maybe every five years to revaluate that says, geez, you know what? The economy is doing so well and the value of this property increased faster than the consumer price index over the last five years. So you might reestablish in five years a new base rate, which might even be higher than that. Of course, it could go down as well, but you may, may do it higher, but then still tie that consumer price index or percentage to that so that there's always some kind of an increase, even though you may be looking at this every five years to kind of renegotiate what the base is. And operations and maintenance. So this one, this is another one where you have to be really clear on, on, on what it is. And this is going to specify the division of responsibility between the parties, right? Um, who's responsible for There's not a lot of this finger pointing of, oh, you, you didn't tell me I was supposed to do that, right? So in this case, the goal should be to assign this to the lessee as much as possible, right? Airports, we just simply don't have the time don't have the money to be fixing a lot of things, especially if they're leasing a building, right? There's um, there's things like you could enter into, not to get too detailed, but a triple net lease, which is, you know, they pay the taxes, they pay the maintenance, they pay the insurance, all of that on a building. And it should be clearly outlined on what their responsibilities are. If that's not the case, then you wanna make sure that in this lease, you're trying to get them to do as much as possible, um, but, uh, but there are gonna be, that, that we know the airport's going to have to do. One way to do that is define it in a minimum standards document. Now, we know the minimum standards document is for the minimum standard to operate, you know, for a commercial operator on an airport. But that doesn't mean that that commercial operator, uh, you know, where, where we shouldn't define, you know, how much snow in the front of their building or mow their grass in, you know, on the property that they're leasing, right? All of that can be identified in a minimum standards document. And then the lease references that. It's a lot easier to update the minimum standards. And a lot of people don't believe that because that's difficult in itself. But it's difficult. It's more difficult to try to amend a bunch of leases uh, instead of referring things to a minimum standards document if you have that information in there. So remember, airports are likely to maintain things not specified in the lease. So in, in the example of you know mowing grass, clearly put it in there that the tenant should mow the grass in front of their building out to a certain out to a certain distance, they're likely going to say, well, you didn't say I had to do that, right? Of course, I didn't say you didn't have to do it, either, but they're going to say, you know, we didn't tell them that they were supposed to do that. So now it likely falls back to the airport. However, it should be negotiated, <coughs> excuse me, with fairness in mind. So using the snow removal and the mow example is, you know, airports have big equipment, right? We have big mowers and we have big, uh, big snow plows. And instead of saying that they have to, they have to remove all the snow in front of their hangar, you could say, 
you need to remove the snow within three feet of your hangar because the airport is willing to come by and make one with our plow. It's going to be a lot easier for us. It's more efficient. And then the tenant doesn't have to, you know, every tenant doesn't have to buy a snowblower um, and, and take their time to, you know, remove a bunch of snow that's that's uh, on the ramp. So make sure that you're, you're, you're negotiating again with that fairness in mind, trying to ensure that it's as, is a, as efficient and cost effective as possible. Uh, yeah, construction and improvements, very important part of the lease, um, especially in an unimproved parcel of land where some uh, individual tenants say they've entered into a 20 uh, year lease on the piece of property. Well, now they got to build their hangar on it. So your lease should clearly specify that commitment. We want to make sure that the hangar is constructed in a timely manner, whether that's within a year of uh, taking uh, of uh, executing the lease agreement. Um, so that the, the thing isn't being constructed over five, 10 years, continuous eyesore and operational problem on the airport. Uh, and as you, and before you do that, you should also have a discussion with a tenant on how this process is going to work and even include the plan review and approval process in the lease itself. So you can say, uh, yes, uh, you have to have your hangar built within a year, uh, submit your plans and specifications for approval. It has to meet city and state requirements, local codes, et cetera, uh, or whatever the airport standards may be, because you may uh, meet with your airport commission and say, and uh, you don't want a bunch of pink hangers and blue hangers and yellow hangers. You want maybe neutral colors that have to be approved, uh, direction of roof lines, et cetera. So those are some of the considerations you want to have uh, the ability as an airport sponsor to approve uh, any types of construction on unimproved land. Uh, I would cover permit requirements, who's responsible for that, and make sure all that stuff's completed as part of the review. Uh, and then again, completion of the hangar, performance. Sometimes an airport may want a, uh, some sort of security uh, or some sort of bond in order to make sure that um, the project is fully financed and will be completed in a timely manner. Um, just like you would as an airport sponsor, if you have an airport project on the airport, you would typically include a safety plan. You're gonna be bringing equipment onto the airport. Um, there's gonna be personnel. Is the, is the folks out there building the hangar going to be, uh, where are they gonna to go to the bathroom? That kind of stuff. They're gonna be coming into your terminal, that kind of stuff. May not have to be in the lease itself, but you should have that in mind when uh, development on the airport is uh, done privately on an unimproved parcel that is under lease at the airport. Similarly, throughout the term of a lease, someone may want to in, um, uh, put a trade fixture, a signage, some sort of improvement in the facility that should be addressed as leasehold improvement in the lease itself. Again, how will that be approved? Uh, will will you, will you allow the tenant? Typically, would not allow the tenant to. Uh, to improve that hangar without approval. So you're, again, making sure it meets the airport standards and uh, local codes under permit. Uh, you don't wanna make sure that the project was done in a timely and workmanship manner that can be included in the uh, leasehold improvement language. And then what happens at the end of the improvement, who owns it? And typically trade fixtures and equipment, especially in a commercial setting would remain with the, uh, the, air, uh, the owner. Uh, and then what happens is again, if it remains with the owner at the termination of the agreement, or does it become part of the airport's property under reversion, which we'll talk about next. Uh, this is uh, reversion and reversionary clause. This is um, this is kind of a hot topic. I know it's um, a lot of uh, you that may be joining in may have uh, uh, leases that are long-term leases on the airport. Maybe they were entered into 20 or 30 years ago they're coming due. All of this happened before uh, anyone uh, existing on airport staff or in the community knew anything about it. All of a sudden, you've got this, this hangar, what to do at the term, uh, end of the term. Uh, but reversion generally refers to the transition of ownership at the and the improvements at the end of the lease agreement. And typically, you want reversionary language in the lease so that it's clearly understood what will happen at the end of the term. Will that uh, so there's plenty of options. One would be that would be typical is the improvements on the lease parcel become the airport's property at the end of the terminate uh, at the end of the agreement. And this is done because you cannot convey the property long term to any it's 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 municipal property, it's airport property protected under grant assurance. 
So you cannot convey that in, in what would be a, almost a fee simple arrangement. So you have to know what's going to happen at the end. Um, now there can be some consternation if you say to a tenant, I, hey, I'm gonna take this property from you at the end of the term. And they're like, well, what happened to my equity position? I've just got, I've just completed uh, pain on this thing and now it's yours and you're gonna rent it back to me. And that can be kind of an interesting discussion. So early on, those things have to be determined right away. You want a lease term that will, there's a clear understanding that that, that term is going to cover the need of the tenants over that time, then it's probably gonna become the airports. Uh, you can soften that with renewal terms, so long as you, again, don't exceed uh, any um, uh, FAA conveyance policy or 50 year term. Uh, another form of uh, reversion would be removing the property. If someone builds a hangar, it's there for 30 years, the lease says, okay, now you can remove it. We'd like to restore the site to another developable site. Uh, that's reversion. The, this, the land is reverting back to the city or the airport. Um, of course, uh, there may be uh, a re-renting option where you would re-rent it back to the tenant or someone else. Uh, in some cases, uh, you can negotiate uh, equity with the owner with some sort of payoff value. Uh, say that the lease comes due, they're, they're still determined the, the hangar's worth $80,000. Maybe the airport wants to purchase the capital asset in order to soften, soften the reversion. Uh, which can be also also done, but then uh, you have to consider what other costs that there are with that. Um, so again, uh, what happens at the end of the lease, you should address that in the lease. It's important to communicate that with a tenant so that there's a clear understanding. Uh, and one of the things under reversion that's often talked about is if if a tenant knows that that hangar at the end of the term is not going to be the uh, theirs anymore, they'll let it go. You can see the hangar in the picture there. Does the airport really want that type of hangar? Uh, it's a maintenance pig. You're gonna be putting money into that forever and things falling apart. So what you can do to combat that is put maintenance provisions in your lease so that there's uh, condition assessments every periodical, maybe five year intervals. So the airport can look at the building from the ground up, have a checklist. Uh, we're gonna look at the foundation, the walls, the lighting, the electrical, the HVAC, and we're gonna hold the tenant to the maintenance standards that we've agreed to so that the end of the term when the facility becomes the airports, it's not falling down. Uh, that gives the uh, tenant incentive to maintain that facility prior to reverting to the airport. But we can answer any questions on that too, but um, that's reversionary clause. Uh, very common in a lease agreement is the obligations of the lessor lessee. So the lessor would be the, the airport. Uh, um, you want to make sure that you can have continuous right of entry, probably with not uh, proper notification to inspect, look at your condition assessments, make sure that the rules and regulations are being followed. And uh, in some cases, whether it's a tea hanger or a facility uh, being rented, you would want the right to show the property to a future uh, tenant. Um, you would want to make sure that it's clear that you have the right as an airport to safely operate the airport uh, you can close the airport or a portion of the airport if you need to uh, without uh, interfering with the lessee's um, ability to conduct business because it's a safety issue or so on. The lessee, the tenant, does have uh, rights too. They have the right to enjoy their facilities. That should be, uh, these things can be enumerated in the lease, uh, the right to quiet enjoyment, um, what uh, what their rights and obligations are under for disposal of waste. Uh, Bill talked about mowing and snow removal. Uh, and then uh, in a commercial setting, you would want to identify the conduct of operations, uh, what, what's expected of employees, if they should be uh, having certifications, be prop properly in uniform, et cetera. And if there's uh, things that happen, uh, fuel spill or something, what are their reporting obligations? So another element is security requirements, right? We know that airports, um, this is, uh, this is a big item. Um, new leases should always reference rules and regulations that are related to security. Um, in, in the case of St. Cloud, right, we operate um, with, the, uh, with the TSA rules under Part 1542. Um, and, uh, and we need to make sure that that's identified in any lease that we have uh, on, on our airport. So 
Uh, we want to make we want to make sure that um, they're aware of our airport security program, um, the things that are that are in it that that are allowed to be uh, referenced, um, and then anything that might change from time to time. Right? We know that um, these rules don't stay that stay the same. They typically, don't get any less. They don't lighten them up usually. Um, so we want to make sure that um, tenants are aware that these rules could change in the future. We want to we want to make special note of things like uh, TSA security threat level that might impact their operations. For example, um, the threat level goes up. Um, all of a sudden, um, security gets tighter at an airport, which means you know maybe less customers can get through, or the customer may be you know may have to be hassled a little bit in terms of going through security to try to get to uh, where they're going. Uh, in addition. Uh, it just may uh, it just may not be able to you know, allow customers to see them on a regular basis. Uh, additionally, with security things, uh, we want to make sure that they know our rules. The basic ones: are, we have a fence that's all the way around our airport. We have gates that you need a badge to get in. You have to um, you have to go through the badging process, go through a security threat assessment check. All these kind of things to be on the airport. We want to make sure they're spelled out. And that they could, you know, something, you know, the rules can change as we go into the future. So damage to facilities. Um, this is another big one. Um, this should identify who's responsible for repairing damage, right? If it's not identified, again, you're going to probably get that finger pointing of, you know, he said, she said, you didn't tell me that I was supposed to fix this. Those kind of things. Um, in the event the tenant owns the building, it should be clear. Uh, as to who is responsible as well. So, sometimes you think that's a no brainer, right? They own the building, they're responsible to, to fix it. Um, but in the case of airports, right, it's on property that's owned by the airport. It's, it's, um, it's a unique relationship. And at times the tenant may think, well, it's on your property. I didn't know I was supposed to fix it. Or in the event that the building is owned by the airport, leased to a tenant, and all of a sudden there's a broken window. Who's supposed to fix that, right? So this is another one of those where it really needs to be really clear as to who's responsible for what. Additionally, what's the time frame to complete it, right? Um, if it's a broken window, the time frame should be a lot less than if a tornado came through like this picture and you got to rebuild the building, right? So you got to be reasonable. However, there should be something in there that talks about the time frame uh, in doing it type of damage, right? Fire, vandalism, natural disasters, they're all different. Um, and some, you know, the time frame should change as well, right? If it's vandalism and somebody's, you know, writing, you know, some derogatory language on the outside of a hangar, you probably want that at least covered up pretty quick. Um, and then the final fix of replacing a panel or painting it correctly or something like that um, might take a little bit longer. Um, but a natural disaster like this, it might be um, you've, I mean, it's going to take a year to rebuild that building, right? So you, you have to understand that the time frames are going to change. The other thing to think about is to what percentage or degree is the building damaged? So if it's, you know, have the clause in there that says something like, if it's less than 50% damaged, are you allowed to rebuild it, right? Is it, uh, if it's more than 50% damaged, can they, can they level the building? And, um, and go ahead and, and rebuild, right? So put some kind of a percentage on there that says, we know that it could be a total loss uh, based on how much damage is, is in there. And fire, of course, it's not that hard to get a total loss um, if there's a fire in one side of the building and the smoke damage gets, gets all the way through it, um, it can certainly do that in a, um, in a hurry. The final piece for this would be, you know, are you gonna collect rent when, when a, if a business is leasing a building from you, but can't conduct business because, um, because their building was damaged, right? So during that time of, you know, with this tornado that comes through and uh, they're trying to rebuild, are you gonna collect rent, right? There's insurance out there, interruption of business insurance that either the airport or the business could get, and that can certainly help with a, you know, help generating a revenue stream. Um, but that's a big question of, uh, and it's, uh, it, you know, every airport's different uh, in terms of what's going to happen there. And right on into insurance, so an insurance obligation, right? We, we finished off that last slide with 
hey, there's insurance to, you know, business interruption insurance. There's a lot, there's insurance for almost everything out there, right? You can certainly do that. But we want to make sure that there is, that there's enough insurance um, to protect, uh, you know, the, the leasehold or protect, um, provide for protection for either the airport or the lessee. Right? So the difference, um, the difference uh, in requirements might vary. So if it's a commercial business um, versus some private single engine airplane order that has a small hangar, right? That's going to be right? they both don't don't probably need five million dollars worth of insurance. Who owns it, right? If uh, if the tenant owns the building. Um, you know, you may say, uh, you know, we, you know, we just want you to have enough insurance so that you can replace that building. If the airport owns it, uh, we may, it may be different, right? Um, so it depends on, on who the owner is, as well as the scale of operation, right? What's the size of it, right? So is there, what's the level, what's that level of kind of risk, if you will, based on the operation? If it's a really, really big building and there's a lot of public that comes to the building, um, your, your, your level of risk is, is higher because there's the potential for either damage or injury uh, that's gonna cost a lot of money. So the scale of operation uh, may help determine what the, um, what the size or the requirement of that insurance is gonna be. And then of course, just the relative risk, right? In the building that you're leasing to somebody on the airport, are they manufacturing fireworks or are they manufacturing teddy bears, right? One has a much more inherent risk than the other. And so you, 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 you just don't need to have as much insurance on the teddy bear manufacturer. So take that into account um, when you're doing insurance. A lot of times it's simply, you know, you're requiring a minimum insurance um, and then you, you let them uh, based on relative risk and those kind of things, uh, increase that, that uh, insurance if they want to. You do have to balance the need for protection with the cost of insurance though. You don't wanna make the minimum insurance requirement so high that it puts the business out of business, right? It's, uh, you gotta find a balance of, hey, let's make sure that we can stay in business and that we're gonna balance that need for protection or liability, you know, balance the need for that risk insurance um, with the value of that, you know, the, the, the revenue stream that's coming in and we don't wanna put them out of, uh, out of business. Finally, to ensure that they're complying you need to get an annual insurance certificate, right? You can be, some, some, some airports are additionally insured, right? They make sure that they're named on the, other times they can simply say, hey, we want, we want to be on the mailing list of your insurance company and make sure that they send us an insurance certificate so that we, that we know you're insured, right? And that, you know, other clauses here are, um, you know, you have to let us know if you're ever dropped by your insurance. That, that'd be one of the reasons for being, you know, getting mailed directly from the insurance company because anytime there's a change, they're going to let you know. Or if you're changing insurance companies, you, you'd want to know that because one, one, you want to know why they're changing insurance companies, but also to make sure that it's a reputable company that is still going to be able to, um, to issue the proper insurance for them. Yes, and uh, what uh, what can cause issues at a at, at a hangar and maybe a potential insurance claim? Of course, environmental conditions are very important to address as well. So your lease should have a section on environmental and how you're going to address compliance with state and local uh, policies on use and storage of especially hazardous materials, uh, fuels, oils, and solvents. It's typical, especially in private hangars, sometimes in tea hangars. And I found that you, you should address those types of uses as, uh, as almost a code issue. Uh, what's worked well for me here in Otana is using your, um, your fire department. Uh, you can have an inspection of a hangar or a private hangar facility. And this is your chance to go into the hangar and see that it's in compliance with the uses as specified in your lease agreement. You can look at, um, you know, you see something like this in this picture and the fire department can see if that stuff's being used and stored properly to code. And that's kind of your lever to enforce that issue. But you should address environment in your lease. Uh, even before that, the slide's a little out of order. You should, before you enter into a lease agreement, especially uh, to improve a piece of land, what the condition is of that. So that there's no dispute later saying, hey, we, we did a soil sample here and uh, there's contamination in here. And then you have a question of who contaminated it. Hey, it was there when I built or, or not. 
So that, that should be addressed and agreed on even prior to entering into the lease. Um, very important to identify responsibility for cleaning up spills. If there's a, there's a problem, who takes care of what, whose insurance covers what, uh, would typically try to pass that along through the lease agreement language to the tenant or the lessee. Uh, most airports are required to have a stormwater pollution prevention plan. And, in, and oftentimes in my leases, I'll specify, including in our minimum standards, that we want you to comply with all of the things that we as an airport have to comply with for use of um, hazardous materials on the airport that may get into the stormwater system under your uh, SWIP. Uh, and then consider ins additional insurance depending on use. As Bill mentioned, if you have a commercial use, you may need higher insurance because there's more uh, exposure there. Uh, but typically, the airport sponsor should expect to indemnify um, itself through the lease agreement language on environmental matters. A couple of these next two slides are pretty basic. I can just breeze over them quickly. Taxes and fees should be addressed in your lease. Um, the big thing is, is you're trying to pass that along to the tenant. If it's private property taxes or uh, things like that, the airport should not be uh, taking those on uh, as the airport authority for that private property on airport premises. So pass that along through language in the lease. It should be described fully. Same thing with fees or assessments. If there's improvements done that require assessments, maybe you're bringing a utility into a taxi lane, similar to a street improvement, those should be assessed and, car and carried forward to the um, uh, tenant in those areas. Uh, liens, this, is tip, this would be typically for commercial or private development on improved or unimproved land in the airport when someone comes in, um, has to borrow in order to um, uh, put the improvement up. Typically a bank or a lender would put a lien on those improvements so there's no default of the loan. The big thing I always remember with liens is as an airport, you have to be careful uh, that you don't allow a lien to be placed against the F or the property itself because that is under FAA grant assurances. It's publicly owned land. You can't con uh, you can't convey a lien or give any uh, lender or otherwise uh, contractor rights to that property. Um, so you should talk about this in a provision in your lease. Um, um, if, if a lender says, all right, there's a, been a default and wants to come in and place some other user in that facility in order to bring, to satisfy the lien, you would want, on a, as the airport, you want to be able to approve that so you don't lose control of that property. You need to know who's in that, uh, uh, prem, in the premises. Uh, I, I usually include language in the last two bullet points. You see some language there on having to do with materials furnished and providing with connection with the building of uh, the structure, uh, not and the tenant shall not permit the filing of a mechanical lien against the premises because it always remains with the airport. Oh, and, and lastly, I, I'll just mention too, you may want to have a surety so that there's no, um, uh, no liability on the airport sponsor. Yeah, so David, uh, you, you hear that, um, you know, a lot of these things and there's lots of information that are in some elements that are also in others. So the idea there is, hey, make sure you got it somewhere. Uh, it may not be the specific one that we talk about, or maybe you, you, you hear that, hey, there's uh, there's two or three different places where you can put it. Certainly doesn't hurt to put it in all of them um, to make sure it's, it's very clear. Uh, but you can see that a lot of these kind of um, have a relationship and go together. And so just making sure that you got it somewhere, I think is, is pretty important. So here, um, you know, David even talked about kind of some defaults on, you know, liens and things like that. And here we'll talk about what happens when you default on, you know, on this lien, what, what does that mean? So this default uh, element is gonna stipulate when the terms of the lease have been violated. For example, what Dave was talking about with liens is if it goes bankrupt, um, if the bank is going to take it over because there's a lien on the building, um, those kind of things. Now that is in default or violation of, of the uh, agreement and the lease. And you want to make sure that that's outlined in there. There, there can be, I mean, you, you can have this list as long as you want to be as clear as you want. No question. Uh, and then we talk about in this area, methods for fixing the default, right? So one way to fix the default of 
them going into bankruptcy is the airport gets to go after whatever is owed to the airport from the tenant that they haven't paid yet, right? So one of the one of the main one of the probably the most common things of somebody being in default of their of their lease is simply failure to pay rent, right? Others some you know might include complying with rules, environmental issues that David talked about with maybe not complying with a SWIP or whatever it is that we might have out there, other illegal activities, but paying but not paying rent probably the most common, and then maybe losing their business to bankruptcy. So how are we going to fix that? We're going to go after our money, um, or we're going to the, the building's going to revert to the airport, right? There's now a re reversionary piece um, that goes in there, um, but all those kind of things should be identified. And then there could be a time frame to allow the fix, right? One of the fixes could simply be, all right, you're in arrears on your rent, and we, you know, we 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 hate to see you go. So let's just try to figure this out. Let's try to fix this, um, and where we're not going to now you know, go in and take the hanger because you don't owe us that much money, but we want to get paid. So is there a time frame that you would allow some kind of a fix? Do you say it's 30 days? And if that doesn't happen, then you can the method for fixing the default, which is now we're going to go in there and we're going to, you know, we're going to kind of seize the property or whatever it is, and it's going to become the airport. So all of that really should be outlined in defaults. It can be, as you can imagine now, this lease is getting pretty gone long but again it's got to be pretty clear on what it is that um, so there's no finger pointing and uh, and when it comes time to you know if there's a default what, what happens but the other thing is you want to write it from both the sponsor and the tenant perspective now typically the the sponsor is is not going to be in default but that doesn't mean it's impossible for the sponsor or the airport to be in default what if the airport um, lets the lets the runway kind of go into disrepair. It's raveling. Now people can't land there, and this person's business relies on airplanes coming in and out of the airport um, so that they can um, so that they can conduct business. Okay, that would be the sponsor is in default, and then you need to write in there what would be a method for fixing that. Right? Maybe the the the, the owner of the airport, in, in our case, the city has to buy the spot, you know, has to buy the tenant out or pay them a certain amount of money, but it can be written from both sides. So make sure that you add that in there as well. Right, and before we move to the next slide, I did have a question pop up um, kind of in this area. Does the FAA offer loan guarantees such as BIA with improvements on tribal leases? I don't know if either of you have experience with that or could help with that question. I, I, familiar with that. Um, so that one, I think, you, unfortunately, you might have to just call the to kind of see um, uh, what the answer might be. Uh, maybe Dave has got more information. Yeah, no, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I know there's some FAA folks on on the on the present on the uh, uh, attendees here and participating and they may know, but I don't believe that the FAA would participate in uh, obligating or funding or providing grants for development on the airport in, in those ways. I don't believe that meets their eligibility, but I'm not certain. Again, you can, in, in a lot of this, there, we'll talk a little bit later on about FAA um, uh, roles and leases. Uh, and generally that comes down to communication with the FAA if there's those types of questions. Yeah, good point, David. Um, uh, the next uh, the next element for me is uh, assignment subletting, and um, so defining assigning uh, or an assignment of a lease is simply transferring all the provisions of the lease to another. So in the event that um, you know somebody is leasing a building from the airport, um, you know they're an FBO fixed base operator um, and they want to get out of this and they want to they want to um, sell their business, it would simply be transferring if they're in year 10 of a 20 year lease that the new owner pick up the lease at 10 as if as if the old uh, tenant was still in there the lease just simply gets assigned as is um, to the new person of course it's certainly possible that you're aware um, you know and you should be aware because pre-approval should be the requirement by the airport in any of these situations um, but if you're aware of them assigning that lease to somebody else, that uh, that who knows maybe you even renegotiate the lease um, you know kind of during that assigning piece. The other piece is subletting. So subletting is just simply leasing part or all of a facility to another. So in the um, in the Sally Smith mechanic shop uh, example, 
Sally Smith has a big hanger. Um, her business, she's trying to, you know, make it, you know, get her business to be a little bit smaller. She still leases this big hangar from the airport, um, and she'd love to generate some revenue from the empty half of the hangar that she's not using. So she'll sublet that, still keep the agreement with the airport, um, continue to pay the airport the, the lease amount that was agreed upon initially, but now there's somebody else in that building that again, the airport should know about. So you wanna make sure that the airport pre-approves anything like this and that that statement is in there that says, you can't do any of this without, you can't unreasonably withhold, you know, assigning or transferring or kind of subletting, but you certainly wanna be aware of it. You know, the fact that leases can be 20 to 30 years long, lots can happen in that time, right? So um, somebody that might've uh, been really gung-ho about they're, you know, being in the aviation industry um, has a 30 year lease uh, on the land and then decides after 20, you know what, I'm getting really tired. I got some other things that are going on or their family wants to move out of the area. They need to go somewhere else. So a lot can happen. Um, so you want to make sure that, that that there's the ability to assign and sublet. Um, otherwise, maybe they wouldn't even enter into uh, the agreement in the first place. And, and that goes to the next bullet of, you know, that can, you know, having this element in a lease can affect the market price of the facility. And what I mean by that is, if it's not in there, somebody uh, that wants to lease and has to go a 30 year lease says, geez, you know what, what happens if I wanna get out of this in 30 years or the value of this goes down or whatever it might be, um, they'd say, geez, you know what, I just know that I can't pay this price for 30 years. So you know, knowing that I got to do it for 30 years, I want to pay less right from the beginning um, because that'll help me in the long run of being able to pay for 30 years. If you have the ability to assign or sublet, then they know, geez, I can get out of this if I really need to. So yes, I'm willing to pay that higher value because I want to get in there now. And heck, if, if things go south, I can always get out of it. So it really can affect the, the price of what that facility is going to go for. And then finally, the airport really, you know, could derive a percentage of the profit from any transaction that takes place. So, um, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, these, um, uh, you know, house flippers that might be happening. You, you, you don't want a developer to come into your airport, um, you know, buy a hangar and then turn around and try to sell it again. And you're assigning these leases back and forth. That takes time and effort. I mean, that's a lot of time and effort by the airport to you know, cancel these other leases, get out of them, enter new ones. You should be compensated for that time. So one, you could require a percentage of the profit based on that. Um, but the other piece is that um, it might dissuade or you know, kind of disincentivize, disincentivize some of these folks from wanting to do that, right? If they say, geez, you know, I really wanna do that. I wanna flip that hangar, but now I gotta give a bunch of it to, to somebody else. I don't think you'll want that on your airport. So you're trying to provide you know, some kind of a, you know, you're trying to dissuade them from really doing that. Uh, and, and by saying, hey, you know what, we're gonna take a percentage of that because that's our time and effort. So it might, it might make them not wanna do that uh, all that often. And then uh, regulatory compliance. Uh, we've talked about this. This is all, you know, this is in several different elements, um, but you know, the lessee should comply with the same regulations as the airport. David talked about, he has that in another clause already. Um, and it can be in several different places in your lease. But the example would be just like David talked about, right? Comply with the same water quality standards or whatever our SWIP says, our stormwater pollution prevention plan, that you've got to do it. The fire codes, right? David talked about getting his fire folks on, on board to do you know, inspection and make sure people are aware of, we've got these fire codes out there. Um, and then you want to include the clause for future rules. Again, I mentioned this earlier, these rules don't get any less. Um, and we want to make sure that we're accounting for the ability for those rules to change and make sure that they're, uh, that they're going to abide by all those rules. It, it also has to be broad enough to include the mix of local, state, and federal rules and regulations. You know this. We on airports, there are, we are highly regulated. And so lots of rules and regulations out there from all these agencies. Uh, and you want to make sure that you, you somehow identify all of them, even if it's simply saying, must comply with all local, state, and federal rules, right? I mean, make sure that that sentence is in there. That's that's pretty important. 
Yeah, and Bill is right. There is a lot of sections of any lease, especially when you're talking about the various different types of leases that you may encounter that uh, have some overlap. Uh, the hold harmless provision uh, is pretty typical in a lease. I often see this uh, in the insurance section. Uh, and what you're saying there is that it, uh, it provides a language that protects the airport uh, from any type of action that a tenant may have or a lessor may have arising out of their operation or negligence. So if they do something wrong on the airport, um, they uh, run into a light fixture or something, um, they're, they're holding their you're holding the airport harmless. Um, and oftentimes there's a quid pro quo here. You'll see that uh, oftentimes that home harmless protection will extend to the lessee as well from any like negligence from the airport sponsor. Non-discrimination, this is one. Uh, sometimes it, it may not make sense to have this in a T-hanger lease. You typically would see this more in a commercial type lease or uh, a, a longer term private hanger lease. But non-discrimination is a basic uh, FAA grant assurance. Uh, so I just include this in my lease. On any lease I have, I have all of our grant assurances, which include non-discrimination. Obviously, we can't uh, prohibit uh, uh, or we can't have discrimination on the race uh, grounds of race, color, or national origin. Um, and that, that holds true for leasing any part of the land too, for any type of commercial, not, even a, a concurrent non-aeronautical use, anything on airport property should extend non-discrimination uh, grant assurance. Uh, living clauses, we've talked about this throughout this presentation, especially in the longer term leases, how does the year, how does a lease, a 20 year lease, say you're in year 18, how does that, jive with what you're doing now. There could be changes over time. You should have living clauses in your lease that cover revision of, revert, revision of rents, escalation, um, changes to airport policy, rules, regulations, or standards and commercial operations. Um, maybe a million dollar liability insurance doesn't cut it 18 years from now. Maybe it's gotta be 5 million. So you have to have clauses that give the airport sponsor the ability, this is kind of the common theme is, uh, maintaining control of the airport through some of these clauses and giving the airport sponsor through your lease agreements the ability to make these changes uh, that happen over time. So that's uh, sort of an explanation on living clauses, which can be seen throughout the lease in a variety of ways. Yeah, and force majeure, this is another one that's uh, usually in all these different leases. And I tell you, it, it's uh, normally you say, man, this just doesn't happen. I mean, it's, uh, you know, we haven't had something since, you know, World War II or whatever it is where, uh, you know, something's got to come in here. But in this case, um, just like this little cartoon is, man, who would have predicted COVID-19 doing what it did, right? Or coming when it did. Obviously, there's scientists that talk about, you know, this pandemic could happen anytime. But really, there's got to be this clause that, that considers unavoidable cause of delay due to acts of God or natural disasters. And this includes if somebody is, you know, conducting a business and their business, I mean, they, they, they got to stop, they got to kind of pause their business for a while because nobody's coming in. And that's based on COVID. And I think a lot of airports actually had to deal with this over the last year, um, provide maybe some financial um, uh, incentives to them or kind of kind of amend their leases based on kind of this, this whole COVID piece. Another, another thing related to this force majeure, again, these acts of God or natural disasters is it can often address construction delays due to weather, right? So if, um, if you have, uh, like David talked about, a lease where they're, uh, you're, you're leasing the premises, um, you want to make sure that they're constructing a hangar um, that they that they construct a hangar within a year of signing the lease, right? They're they're renting the property or leasing the property, um, and they get about halfway done with their building, and all of a sudden a tornado comes in and and tears the whole thing down. Well, there's no way that they're going to be able to get that building completed in a year from when they, um, when they sign the lease, and that's to no fault of their own, right? That was that was uh, this you know act of God, natural disaster, that tornado came through and did it. So this clause helps with that. Um, and it's really something that interrupts the construction that the contractors should not be held liable for, especially in um, things like, um, you know, even if you have it with a contractor that's doing some work 
um, out at out at your facility. You know, you're putting concrete down somewhere, and it just it rains every day all summer. There, there's just nothing you can do about that. So there there needs to be extensions based on the force majeure clause. And hold over. This one's pretty. Uh, this one's pretty interesting. Uh, it allows the sponsor to simply extend the lease and its provisions on a short-term basis. So, for example, um, you know, bridging the gap between a lease expiring and continuing to negotiate that lease. Think continuing resolution in Congress, right? Congress is trying to, um, you know, they're trying to pass a bill, a reauthorization bill by September 30. Um, they don't get it done. It has been very typical that they just simply say, all right, we're going to, you know, we'll pass a continuing resolution, which keeps the lights on and keeps things going. But they might say, you know what, we're going to do this for a couple months and we'll just do what we did last year, right? So whatever the funding level was, prorate that for two months. And that's what they got. Similar in this case is if you know that, you know, you're going to get a, you're going to get a deal done. You're just, having, you're just struggling with trying to, you, you know, negotiate the final details of it. Um, and you, you have this clause in there, this holdover clause that says, okay, it doesn't look like we're going to get it done by the end of the month when the, when the um, lease expires. So we'll invoke the holdover clause and we'll go on a month to month basis on this, on this short term basis. Now, again, this should not be confused with lease extensions, right? Lease extensions are something like, hey, we're going to extend this lease and all its provisions for a longer term, like five years, 10 years, whatever it might be. The holdover is simply month to month. Now, there should be, you know, you should have language in there that talks about how the holdover will be used, though, right? It'll be, you know, if there's an escalation clause in there that says normally at the end of the month that we would have increased the rent by the price index, right? 2% or whatever it is, that should still, that should still go in, right? On a month to month basis, that should still go in there um, while they're doing it. Um, it's it really shouldn't be used all that often though, right? The you know if you talk to an attorney, they're going to say, "Man, you really shouldn't count on this holdover." So, is there a way to try to again dissuade folks from wanting to say, "Oh, hey, don't worry about you know, don't worry about the negotiation. We can kind of take our time because we've got this holdover clause. It's in there, but we, we'd rather not use it. I'd rather have a lease extension and. Have a longer term because if something goes south over, now we're going to be sol so do you build some kind of a premium in if it's used for example in the example of okay, the the lease expires and uh you go up by two percent um that you do the two percent but then you also have a premium in that says anytime we're in the holdover mode that we're going to also increase it by another two percent or something that would be you know kind of incentivize them to want to negotiate and be done with the lease and have a lease extension in place by the time it expires. So those things, um, the holdover is is uh, is nice to have that it continues to kind of keep that lease going on a month to month basis, but you don't want to make it so easy that that's kind of where they want to go with it um, when it expires. Yeah. So basically it to this point we want to leave time for questions of course and any conversation discussion about this but we sort of covered the elements of the a typical elements of a lease but the the thing to keep in mind is and you could probably get this from the tone of the presentation is you want to protect the airports uh both obligations and interests in running the airport um so there can be local circumstances or airport specific circumstances that maybe we haven't talked about that you'll uh, you may consider uh, when you're uh, looking at leasing policy on the airport. And also when you're looking at leasing policy, oftentimes it comes up, well, what, what's the, the FAA's interest in this? Do I have to have it approved by the FAA? Those types of things. And typically the FAA doesn't get involved with the review of all leases and you don't need their approval. However, that does not mean we don't want to communicate with the FAA. That can be a tremendous resource when you're developing leases so that you don't miss something. Because in, as an airport, you are obligated maybe differently than most uh, types of commercial leases. You have your federal assurances. And so if the FAA does get involved, the primary issues they are looking at are listed there. They want to make sure that you're not denying uh, the federal or you're not granting or not denying right, rights that are contrary to federal rules or policy of the FAA. Uh, you want to uh, 
uh, make sure that you maintain control, preserve the powers and rights of the airport for grant assurance. Um, you do not want to uh, grant any sort of authority that would uh, detract from the airport's ability to serve the public as your primary role, is to serve the public as a uh, as an airport. That's why it was developed. So you don't want to give away any of those rights or uh, allow the airport to be used in any different types of ways. And then meet your grant assurances, be in compliance. Uh, just in quickly to go through what those are, uh, the, the ones I want to hit on uh, on the next slide would be, uh, there's a whole list of I think it's 30 some grant assurances. You can see it, it's in the FAA order that will be in the resource list. But if you're an airport, chances are that you're under a grant assurances and many of those assurances you have to transfer or carry forward into all your agreements. Uh, the, the big ones here that I highlighted are economic non-discrimination, fee and rental structure and, and uh, 38 hangar construction. Uh, so real quickly on those three, and there's others, but economic, economic non-discrimination we sort of talked about already. Uh, make the airport available as an airport for public use on reasonable terms and without unjust discrimination on all types for all types of uh, aeronautical activities at the public airport, usually put in a lease agreement. Uh, the other one is a fee and rental structure, which we also covered in depth here, which is maintaining a fee and rental structure for facilities and services at the airport, which will make the airport as self-sustaining as possible. Uh, so that factors into when you're setting up your rents and charges. One thing I would mention on that too, uh, Bill had talked about um, market value on setting rents. Rents. The FAA has, a has if you use a cost approach, say you have a T-hanger and you want to set a rate uh, based on cost of the T-hanger or uh, purchasing the land, the FAA wants to make sure that you you don't um, include that in your analysis of costs. In other words, if you received federal grant money for that T hanger, you can't then assign that as a cost to to the tenant. Uh, so I have to be a little bit careful about that. Uh, it would have to be more related to maintenance and operational costs of the facility. And then hangar construction uh, grant assurance number 38. Uh, the big thing to know there is you can enter into an agreement with someone to build a hangar. If the airport allows you to do that, they may impose these types of restrictions or conditions. And the FAA generally supports that because they want to make sure that their oblig our obligations are being met. Now, the ones that I haven't listed are preserving rights and powers of the airport and uh, also exclusive rights. If it's a commercial type lease, you do know you don't want to uh, offer any entity that's going to enter into a lease agreement at your airport exclusive right to do only you are the only one that can do aircraft maintenance. No, you cannot do that. Uh, that's typically covered under minimum standards, which was probably a, a previous presentation. We got leases. Someone else got minimum standards. I don't know which one's better, but uh, that's what I had on uh, assurances. <laughs> Well, great. Thank you both so much for this information in the presentation. I do have their contact information up here on this slide, but now we'd like to open it up to the group participating today. And you can either unmute your phone and ask a question, or you can include it in the chat box and I can um, read that off. So we're open to questions. Quiet group this morning. I think Bill covered everything. <laughs> right. I love it. And, and of course, the, you know, the thing with this is, you know, I, I mean, really, we, you could, I mean, every one of those elements, you could go on for a half an hour, just about, you know, different possibilities and those kind of things. And so um, they, you know, these leases can get, you know, really long. Um, but the idea there is to really um, make sure that you have you know that you're just really clear on what what you've got understand the grant assurances like david's talking about there's a great point that he brought up at the end there of you know if i'm trying to lease a building and, and it really comes into play in hangars um that airports that are allowed to use uh faa assistance on hangars to, to construct them that you can't take 
the replacement cost of that into account, right? It's going to be the maintenance cost so that, um, you know, that's where what what's what one airport rents their T hanger for versus somebody else. It may be wildly different based on that. But the other piece is, you know, if there's a terminal building where, you know, federal funds were used, same thing, right? We're not allowed to, you know, charge the airline or another tenant that cost that was, just, you know, the, the, the replacement cost of that because it was already paid for, right? We can talk about operations and maintenance, but not that replacement cost. That was a great point. Great, and I do want to point out, Bill, that um, Nancy Nistler from the FA said that she hopes you're not manufacturing teddy bears and fireworks in your hangers at St. Cloud. <laughs> <laughs> yes, fireworks are okay, but not I know, not teddy bears, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> that is for sure, uh, non-compliant, that, that's right. But if we leased a building, uh, that had a, that, that was allowed to do a non -air, you know as a non aeronautical use that um, you know in an area that was approved by the FAA for non aeronautical use then teddy bears would be allowed I think. <laughs> Great. Are there any other questions or thoughts or comments? Otherwise, we really appreciate everyone's time this morning. Um, again, Catherine sent out the presentation and a resource page, so you can look there for additional information. Um, she also sent a link to a survey if you want to follow up about um, these presentations and this spring series that we had. And if you have any other topics that you're interested in, to let her know as well. Otherwise, Catherine, is there anything else you need to add? No, you uh, summed it up very well. And thank you, Dave and Will and Mel or Dave and Bill and Melissa for putting everything together for this today's presentation and everyone that participated in the spring series. We really appreciate it. We had great participation throughout. And again, all the other presentations are available on our website. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yep. you so much, everyone. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you for attending.